I decided that I was going to wear this as the same way that I wore the G-Shock, and so I did. How your sniper rifle shoots changes by elevation because the air is thinner. My, my roommate uh, was the biggest Tiger Woods fan in the entire world. And at one point, you know, he's just like, hey man, can we get a picture together? So with, with the Seamaster, did you, did you keep that for best or did you ever wear it in service? So this one I kept for best, right? So I, I don't know what it was. You know, it was the first nice one that I ever had. It's the chronograph, but it's basically like the, the bond, uh, the Pierce Brosnan bond basically. But uh, when, when you, so for the most part, a lot of my deployments, I wore Cassia G-Shock, um, the first two. The, the Navy does uh, re-enlistment bonuses. So like you can end up getting paid pretty well, you know, periodically um, through your career if you uh, re-enlist. So I did a re-enlistment and uh, you get a big check. And so, you know, as being, you know, a type A, you know, crazy person who's doing that, usually people, that's the time you buy cool toys. I mean, if you're smart, you buy something sensible, you, you know, put a down payment on a house or something like that, but I'm basically an idiot. So uh, <laughs> the I, I bought a Rolex. People buy like motorcycles or off-road vehicles or, you know, cool toys, boats or whatever it is, sweet guns that they want for their personal self, like whatever it's, that's, you know, that, that is the special thing for you. So I got, I bought a, uh, a Rolex. I was going to get the, uh, the Submariner just because of the heritage, but I got the deep sea. So I bought this watch and this was, uh, I decided that I was going to wear this as the same way that I wore the G-Shock. And so I did. So this one stayed on my wrist for, I probably wore this most every day for about 10 years. I wore this in skydiving. I wore it scuba diving. I wore this in combat missions. I've been in a bunch of gunfights in this. I've been in terrible tragedies in this that I'll never forget. Uh, I've, I wore, you know, I've banged this on Humvees. I've scratched this up. I broke the pip on it. I, uh, and I wore it until it stopped. It took about 12 years for this watch to just stop. And then I got it service. It's still good. Um, then when I got out of the military, I wore this for the birth of four of my kids, my marriage. Um, th this, this meant a lot to me. And I bought it in a mall. Like there's nothing necessarily special about how I got it, but like the, the memories that are attached to this, um, you know, it's the, the same reason I love watches. It's not necessarily unique to the SEAL teams. There's, there's a lot of people who are really into watches, um, mm. but it is uncommon to wear them in combat. And people are like, what are you doing? And they're like, I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> you're like, there's better watches to do that stuff with. They're like, I know, but it's not as cool. And it makes me feel good. And so, <laughs> Uh, that's really interesting that you say that because one of the questions I had, obviously you've been put through very harsh conditions, been physically tested uh, to the extreme. And uh, a lot of watches kind of brag about their specifications, don't they? They boast quite, um, quite well, mil spec quite often, some, some watches will say. So, I mean, you probably have more experience than most. Right. Like, what do do some of these watches live up to some of the things that they say they can do or do you find that once you get to a certain point they they all just crumble into dust eventually i think i've flooded or destroyed five g-shocks um right. so I, I treat those very differently though than the watch that's on your wrist if, yeah if you destroy a rolex that's on your wrist like you probably have other problems yeah um, <laughs> I mean, that's just the reality of it, right? Like it's a stainless steel watch. It's fine. It's just, sure. you know, it's, it's both a piece of jewelry, but still useful. But I, I would say that, uh, very often in special operations, uh, we like to go away from mil spec stuff just because it's very heavy. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily, I think kind of everything disappoints in the terms of function. A lot of times civilian really? off the shelf kind of stuff is better. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, Garmin watches that can tell you your elevation, your density, altitude, uh, how your sniper rifle shoots changes by elevation because the air is thinner. And then when barometric pressure comes through, that actually ch effectively also changes the altitude that you're at. So like your watch can tell you where you're at. So like you, where you aim and like how you dial your gun, it's, it's a better tool, but there's also like weather tools that I bring like a Kestrel tells you all that stuff. And Mm. You go out before missions and do that. So, like, you could have that on your wrist, but you know, I was a little precious about wearing a Rolex because I thought it was cool. So, I just had a different device. You know, GPS stuff also you can do through your watch. So, like, that kind of useful stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Makes more sense to wear a Garmin um, as long as the Garmin doesn't talk out and has signal. So they make military versions of those. Right. But like light is right. We want to be nimble and quick and be faster than the enemy. So the mil spec stuff I think is oversold. I would also say that I am unequivocally a shallow water diver. I'm not, yeah, right. I, I'm the deep sea. The, the deepest like, like you do bounce dives to train, but like we dove very shallow. And a lot of that is because we breathe O2 and not uh, not like mixed gas. There are there are special SEAL teams that do uh, uh, deeper dives and they do mixed gas and go, and that's totally different. But like a Drager, which is a, you know a common thing, you you don't if you dive forty feet, like that's you have to like stop your dive eventually. Like what well, pure oxygen becomes toxic uh, at, under pressure, so like you're diving not not super deep. So like the Plastic watches would survive that for sure. Yeah, 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 sure. Were there any watches that you included in your collection during your time in the seals that didn't cut the mustard? Uh, I mean, I certainly wore the the watches that were like Suntos. Um, I, I, I wore those, and I, I definitely melted some of those from like using a blowtorch on it. The bezels would break off that, so like garments and all of those things. You know the the GPS watches, I definitely broke a lot of those. Um, the Casio G-Shock, when you put on the, uh, you know, we thought that that was too bright. And what I didn't know about a Casio G-Shock that you guys probably do, when you peel these things up, one of the things that makes them tough is they put spacers in them, like teeny tiny spacers all under like the rubber plastic. And when you take that off one time, and then like the things fall apart, kind of like there's more pieces than they, when you took it apart and you put it back together, you have more pieces. You're like, geez, I don't know where this goes. And that's those are just yeah. spacers to uh, to absorb shock when when you end up taking those out. So we would put like a, a coating, like a red brake light on it, just to, to to mute the color, so you don't ever sort like you know if you're in the, in the middle of the night and you're like sneaking up on somebody and then a glowing like you can see the thing like a hundred yards away. Yeah. Um, and we want to be sneaky ninja frogmen. So, uh, you know, we would, we'd cover it with like that. And then you, you basically break your watch by doing that. I wanted to be a sneaky peeky ninja. So uh, you'd, <laughs> you'd, you'd cover that and basically destroy the watch. But like, I, I definitely like, for some reason, the bezels on a lot of those like uh, Garmin watches I broke off and they're, they're not designed for, uh, you know, idiot frogmen. <laughs> sneaky ninja frogmen. I think that's a good band name. Right. <laughs> So you mentioned um, a few kind of specialisms there within the SEALs. Did you have a specialism? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a couple. I, I ended up, uh, I was a sniper. I was a breacher. Um, so a breacher opens doors so that you can do that with explosives or like uh, quickie saws, which like can cut like concrete and metal and all that kind of stuff. Uh, chainsaws just to, you know, just cut a wood door open or something like that. Um, you know, you learn to use like sledgehammers and stuff just to kind of get in and then you can do exothermic, which is like blow torches. Um, and I was at JTAC, a joint terminal attack controller, which is you talk to the airplanes in order to drop bombs on something, somebody has to be on the ground. So like you have to be able to talk to airplanes and that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, the GPS and that kind of stuff is probably more helpful, but I, I had a hand GPS and I would do that. So JTAC, presumably getting that on time is very important. Right. Um, did you rely just on your wristwatch for that, or did you have uh, uh, what do they call it? Redundancy. Uh, so there's a, there's redundancy, and like you're talking directly. So there's there's different ways to do that. Um, but like th there are GPSs that you're allowed to use and not allowed to use. Um, I'm sure that's probably different now. But like civilian GPSs, you weren't allowed to use to actually lays a target and timing because the, the, those are GPS guided bombs and stuff like that. But for the most part, you are talking to a human um, and they're talking to you and you're trying to describe a, a situation to them. You're like, hey, I would like you to drop a bomb on this thing. There's bad guys shooting at us. Can you see them? And they're like, no, I'm, I'm in an airplane at, you know, 800 miles an hour above your head. You're like, cool. All right. Now we're going to talk about where I want the bomb. And uh, so a lot of that stuff, like the, the time didn't necessarily matter. Um, and then a lot of the, like when you're really relying on time, it's a lot of backup. So like what we did do, which I think was interesting is we used to do time hacks. So everybody is in a room before a mission. You don't do it every single time, but like you do it often and be like, all right, the, the leading person in the room be like, I have 10 o'clock in, you know, 30 seconds, everybody, it's going to be 10 o'clock in 30 seconds. 
Yeah. And so everybody synchro synchronized watches. It said, you know, and they count down, you know, so they give everybody like a full minute, get your watch ready. So everybody has the same time before you go out on a mission. And theoretically you're like, all right, go time is at, you know, 13, you know, whatever, 1300 or whatever. Oh, 100. It's in, in the middle of the night, right? We're going to breach at that exact time. But you would really do it over the radio. You, like if you're really relying on time, that means like your radios are down and all that kind of stuff. So that all that stuff's back up. So, you know, I felt confidence rolling with a Rolex, uh, you know, my plus, my plus or two, my plus or minus two seconds. I was going to be okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, wait. Well, oh, <laughs> never mind. So when you synchronize watches, everyone would be synchronizing different watches or they, they'd all have their own. Right. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I, what was funny, uh, very often in the military, there'd be, uh, you're supposed to be five minutes early. So every now and again, somebody would synchronize the watches to the wrong time and it would be early. They're like, I'm always early. So everybody go off my watch and you're like, but shouldn't we can use GPS time. Isn't what like, then you just be five minutes early. Honestly, that <laughs> happened all the time. And you're like, why are we, this is so stupid. And I, you know, I'm kind of a natural dissenter, so I was, uh, I was not a, probably not that great of a military guy. Um, <laughs> with the, the whole uniform and vibe thing. Luckily, the SEAL teams are also not super into that. But uh, we, we would, how we would synchronize watches always bothered me. Yeah, I used to do that when I, you know, when you wake up a bit blurry eyed and you had to catch the bus. You glance at your watch <laughs> and be like. Oh no! But then you remembered later that right, you right. set it early. <laughs> oh, that's right. I'm, I'm early. It's okay. It's <laughs> so some of the other watches that your fellow Navy SEALs were wearing. What did you see? Was it mostly G-Shocks? Did anyone else have a sneaky Rolex here and there? Absolutely. So there, there, there is a culture of Rolex. Um, there's even a guy who started his own uh, watch company. He has his the the Resco watch company. So he. I think the rumor has it, he took an entire enlistment bonus, like $100,000 and bought like a Patek or something with it. So he was a maniac <laughs> and he, he has his own watch company and started it, I think, which is pretty cool. Um, there's just a culture of it. There's actually a guy uh, who's a CIA case officer uh, who does a website called Watches of Espionage, mm -hmm. um, which is awesome. And basically he, he writes articles about basically the culture of like special operations and the sneaky Rolex that people wore, like I, I knew the, the the dog guy in the Bin Laden raid has an, uh, an article cheese uh, of like him wearing a Rolex on the Bin Laden raid and like the Sabaran and he wrote and there's a cool article that you'd follow on watches of espionage and like I, I knew him when I checked into the teams and that kind of stuff and like just it, so I, it wasn't unique to me, but it wasn't necessarily it wasn't uncommon, but it wasn't like 100% of the dudes are rolling around with, you know, ridiculously expensive watches but you know a, a, a dude here or there in platoons would wear stuff like that and then the history of it just guys you know back in the day wore rolex tutors were issued so there's a there's a connection to that heritage there it's not just you guys are absolutely blowing all your cash on reshard meals and protect philippe's and no we can't afford we can't afford quite that but the, the rolex we'll blow money it'll be bad you know we're not uh <laughs> we'll be parted from our money pretty easily if as long as it's cool <laughs> What are some uh, standout moments from your career with the Navy SEALs? When I went through training, uh, one of the weirdest things of all time happened. Um, we trained with none other than the Tag Heuer ambassador himself, Tiger Woods. Um, and then a Rolex ambassador. <laughs> right. Well, with the whole <laughs> boat on your head thing. No, he didn't do any of that. So later on, we did uh, SEAL qualification training, which is more, uh, they teach you actually how to be a SEAL, a soldier, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you do shooting and, you know, in order to be a really good shot, you just shoot a lot and you have great instruction and you go slow and you just do it again and again and repetition, and basically in life, anything to do that. Brilliance in the basics, so you do that. So we were doing our shooting training and our, you know, how do you clear rooms? And for some reason, for about a month of my training, Tiger Woods was a part of it. Do you have any reasoning for that? Uh, so I, a lot of it is his background and his dad was a Green Beret. And I think that he was at a crossroads and he was, this was like two, between 2005 and 2006. And he was as famous as a person that walks this earth. He was friendly to us, my, my roommate, uh, was the biggest Tiger Woods fan in the entire world. And at one point, you know, he's just like, hey man, can we get a picture together? 
And he was nice enough to take a picture and that picture was washed out and didn't come out because at that time, you know, we actually had to develop film and stuff. Uh-huh. And so it was, it was pretty devastating. But my my friend did uh, right after that buy a tag lawyer, a Carrera. <laughs> the marketing works. Right. right. He's, he's, he's a deep sea guy, though. So he's Rolex. And uh, I guess I, I I don't know, maybe I copied Tiger after that. Uh, unbeknownst to me, but uh, that was pretty strange. Yeah. So, post Navy SEALs, you made it through. You decided you didn't want to do that all the way to retirement because you're not entirely crazy, but you're still a little bit crazy. So you still carried on collecting watches. How has that gone for you? I did. So I've gotten a lot more into it. So I I got out of the military because uh, my wife was pregnant and I, I wanted to start a family and it's it's just a tough thing to, to do that. So I'm now like eight years later, I have four kids. Um, I went and got, uh, I went to business school right afterwards. So I, I went to Wharton for my MBA. And then, uh, you know, I worked for two years at Amazon and now I started my own company. And some, you know, it took a number of years, but I got back into watches. And so now I've always collected tool watches and I was able to get, you know, some of the watches that I had dreamed of owning since I was a little kid, like the, you know, the, the Pepsi GMT, you know, like Tom Selleck, okay. sweet mustache, you know, rolling in Hawaii <laughs> in a Ferrari and a, a GMT, uh, you know, like I'm still hoping to drive somebody else's Ferrari, you know, and live in their house. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, you know, I got way more into watches and, uh, honestly, during that period, I was watching, you know, you guys and, and videos and, uh, you know, a bunch of other people on YouTube who are a little bit more reasonable, who don't shout at everybody. And, uh, <laughs> the, you know, I just, I, I've learned to really love, uh, a lot of stuff. And, and, and so I, I was able to collect some more of the Rolex watches that I really always dreamed of having. And I have a little bit of a collection, but, uh, I've gotten into it even more recently and like just weird things have happened. And now, now I'm into like Moser. I own a Moser right now. So that's what I'm wearing right now. Ooh. Streamliner. So that's pretty cool. Smoked nice. salmon. The smoked salmon that uh, doesn't look like smoked salmon at all. And I'm pretty sure it's a joke. But, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that there's something so cool about watches that is uh, time, I think, is our most precious thing that we have in this life, time with our families, time doing the things that we care about. And a mechanical watch kind of reminds you of that. And uh, time is kind of different for everybody. Sometimes time moves really fast. Sometimes it moves really slow, but it's the same. And it's kind of cool that you have a mechanism on your wrist that through your movement will always keep that. And it keeps it a little bit different for you than it does someone else. And it's highly personal. And it reminds, you know, every time you look down at it, it reminds you of you know, where you are, the the time that you have on this earth, that like your time is different than everybody else's, how much you get to do. There's something romantic about it. There's something awesome. There's something personal. And I I really think that that's cool. And so I, uh, you know, I like, I like watches and I've met friends through watches that I never thought I would have. Um, It's super nerdy. And, uh, you know, I let my nerd flag out there and I've met a bunch of really interesting people. And by talking about it, a bunch of like military veterans are like, dude, I'm in watches, too. And a lot of people have reached out to me on that. And I think that's like super cool. And I didn't know that. And like a lot of like my friends all knew I was into watches. But when people reach out, like, dude, I didn't know you were into this. Like, yeah, I'm a maniac into it. Like, I don't it's it's like a debilitating disease. And uh, (laughs) yeah, it's really cool. You mentioned um, the the precious nature of time and you've decided to use um, your time after the Navy SEALs to do something quite incredible with Zero Eyes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So I went to a middle school in Connecticut that uh, was called Chalk Hill. It got renamed Sandy Hook Elementary School. So that was like one of the worst shootings that has ever occurred. It was little kids and it's basically like my hometown. And I, I went to school in college with kids who were in the Columbine shooting. So that was another, like the wor- that, when that happened, that was the worst one. And uh, I got married in a, in a courthouse that, I, that had a mass shooting. And these things have happened in the United States and kind of hit me personally. And so I got out of the military and I worked for Amazon and it didn't really scratch the itch of me doing something bigger that mattered more and kind of living to the standard that I want to live to of having purpose making the world a better place. And the 
the kind of gun violence in schools that we have seen, uh, you know, where some maniac goes and shoots things, uh, I, I have not been satisfied by what we have done to contend with that. So a few of my friends also from the SEAL teams, we started a company called Zero Eyes. And we look at your existing video cameras and we say, if there's a gun out exposed, um, we'll let authorities know. And, you know, sometimes that, that could be benign. That could be somebody who's legally carrying it, fine, no problem, but, uh, you know, they're notified. But if, if, if it's a malicious actor doing that, we can give time before shots are fired and at least mitigate the situation by letting people know exactly where they need to go or by, you know, reducing the entire thing, you know, potentially preventing it. Because if you knew that, because a lot of these people are deranged and it's mental health problems and the Uvalde shooter, which was a, a terrible one more recently, he was on camera for like 30 minutes before he ever pulled the trigger. And if we do these, you know, like our company's whole mission is to reduce gun violence and we're going to do it when, you know, these deranged individuals show their gun really early, which is again and again and again. And we're not going to stop doing it. It's a mission. We're going to, you know, our company's growing really big. We do it mostly with veterans, military veterans, people who care, people who are going to see something to the end. And we're going to do it in a way that doesn't invade your privacy. We're going to do like, because we don't, it's like the cameras are already there and we're just using AI to look at that and verify it with a human and operation center where we're doing all in the U.S. We do it all with the monitoring is like military personnel, um, people who understand that situation so we can de-escalate things and hopefully make the world a little bit better, um, make the U.S., uh, you know, I, I love my home, but there's embarrassing problems and I want to solve them and I'm going to spend my my time to do that. It's incredibly admirable and, um, you know, it really falls into the the mindset of if you want something done, to do it yourself and you, and you, you really have done that. It's quite incredible. That's it. Well, there you go. That is the life of a former Navy SEAL, watch collector, and generally all-round hero, I think. It's not, let's not get crazy here. I don't think that's crazy at all. I think it is an incredibly admirable thing to do. Um, you could just spend your whole time browsing uh, watch catalogs instead, but you choose to spend only some of the time browsing watch catalogs. <laughs> just a little bit. Good. Much to the chagrin of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I really do appreciate you doing that and sharing your amazing stories and uh, your watch collection as well. Um, if you're a listener, if you have any questions for Rob, pop them down in the comments below and uh, maybe we'll bring him back if he wants to come and we'll go through some of those. Thank you so much for watching. Please do like and subscribe as well. And uh, check out watchfinder.com for your next purchase, including you, Rob. Goodbye. <laughs>